So it's 1951. We've come back from a continental tour. I lived in an international house. When you go off for a summer, or any parts thereof, if you give the house administration notice, they will, um, they, they will allow somebody to take your room, they'll lock up all your belongings in the closet, and they put in clothes to you for that person who's only going to be there two or three months. And I did that. After the Continental Tour, we get back to New York, and um, I was early for that young man who had my room. Incidentally, he was a student from Texas who was getting a Ph.D. in powdered milk. <laughs> At any rate, I go there, and he said, oh, sir, I heard you. I said, it's quite all right. I said, I can stay across the street in, in Claremont or something. That's where the Juilliard students then stayed. He said, I only need a week. I said, you have it. It's quite all right. I said, may I go in the closet? I just want to get one thing out. So I go in there and get something out, something to wear, maybe. And I said, and I promise you, I will not trouble you again. And he, he was fine. I said, this is your room. Anyway, so I do go to stay at this place at Fairmont something. It is a pigsty, I discover. And... Um, so I leave my baggage there and take only what I need, toilet articles, and go and stay in the gym at Lincoln University, at the um, International House, because they set up beds, cots around there. And not many of us were there, and it was great, and we laughed a great deal. We all thought we were back in grade school or something. It's only seven days. When I um, go there with my friends, Sami Ural from Turkey and Pierre Gonoural when they know this. Now you're going to move back, yes? We go to gather my things. There was a bag, so big, in which were my athletic supporter, my spikes, and these many index cards for a PhD that I was working on. All At on, Columbia. All in Columbia, on, all on the poet Rabindranath Tagore from India. That morning, we go there to get my stuff. The only thing that's gone is one tie, of, of dreadful taste, <laughs> one tie and that bag. Because on top of the bag, you see, were a couple of cameras I had one running, because we used to get little gifts like that. I mean, now you get money. I mean, yes. real, <laughs> real money. When I say money, not, not money, I mean lots of it. Yes. And there were a couple of cameras and a couple other things that were just on top. I may have pulled them out to show these people, my friends. And they were just on top, sitting there. Well, that bag was gone. Okay, we cut to the track writers' press conference. And um, they have read in the papers that, that I am staying in New York to be near the club so that I can make the Olympics and stay in training. But I was not going to go back to teach at Lincoln, because I had taught there the year before. I wasn't going back to teach. And Reggie Pierman said, that's not what it is at all. And Reggie's one of my dearest and best friends. He was a runner, too. And Jesse Abramson, who was the best sports writer probably ever, I mean for track, he wrote for the Herald Tribune, Joe Sheehan for Times. He said, what is it, Reg? And he told him this whole story of my thesis, the index, and that's why he doesn't know what he's going to do. Well, um, Shenley reads this account in the New York Tribune and the New York, I mean, the Herald Tribune and the New York Times and in, in Bonnie Miller's place, uh, Bonnie, you know, uh, Lou Miller and Bonnie Kromenko. They all have this story. And they say, that's the guy we want. He's to teach, which means he must be well-spoken. He's a nationally acclaimed athlete. That's the guy we want. And they call and me up. And he's a Ph.D. candidate yeah, and they at call Columbia. Me up <laughs> yes. And get me in there. It's a better, longer story about how yes. they got me in there, but we'll, I'll tell you that another yes. time. Yes. They get me in there and give me this extraordinary job. 
And I said, what do I do? He said, well, we haven't made out the thing, thing for it yet, but uh, you're, you're called the National Sales Representative for Stanley Import Corporation. I said, what do I do? He said, well, David's going to straighten you out, and he'll tell you what to do. I didn't do anything. I went to I'd visit some bars in Harlem. I controlled all of Dewar's white label in Harlem <laughs> and parts of the Bronx, uh, one, a little bit of Brooklyn, and some places in Midtown, New York City. And four years later, um, Mr. O'Leary, the president of Shenley Import, called me up at home, and he said, Kid, you probably read in the papers, we're now merging with the domestic company, and we're going to be called Shenley Industries. I said, yes, sir, I heard that. He said, well, we're kicking you even farther upstairs. I mean, a big, fat job that's going to be it's also on the national level. I forgot I also had to fly to t Chicago and... I did nothing, however, when I did, when I, I make these appearances, that's it. Anyway, I said, we will. I said, well, sir, I have to think about that. He said, kid, I thought you liked us. I said, no, I love all you guys. Miss Tilde and Sally Spear, Elsie Sullivan, and all these guys I work with and for. I love you guys, and I love also the... Um, the underground. He says, it's called the underworld, kid. <laughs> Go they really introduce me to yes. the underbelly of American <laughs> business. I mean in that business. He said, well, look. I said, can I call you tomorrow? He says, now tomorrow's Saturday. I said, you mean you have a weekend to think about it? I said, thank you, sir. I'll call you Monday. I did hang up. I called my butcher. Just a little ways around the corner. I started ordering some food. They also had great seafood. I ordered some of both. Began to prepare dinner. Realized I hadn't invited anybody. <laughs> I called Josephine first. She was in Brooklyn then, still living at home. And she's dying. I'll be right there. I called Leontine. She said, oh, honey, I'll be right up. She's still right where she is now. And I called Susan. Henry found the answers. He said, I, kid, I know you're not calling for me. I said... He always smiled, but I never called him Hank. I said, Henry. <laughs> I said, Henry, I'm making dinner, and you both invited. He says, I can't. Sue, it's Roscoe. She comes to the phone. She says, dying. I said, I'm making dinner. She says, Hank, are you still going to that meeting you have to have? Yes. <laughs> and I could see her on the phone. I said, well, yes, I can come. So they came, and... I knew nothing until some point when Leontine suspected the dinner and said, I suspect this dinner. I said, why? You're not enjoying it. She said, oh, honey, it's heaven. Susan said, why? We're the ones who taught Roscoe to cook. We told him when he moved into a apartment, he's going to have to cook. And she said, and I sent him that subscription to Gourmet. And she said, are the guys coming? I said, yeah, we're going to go to the Palladium after. But I didn't invite them for dinner. So the landing knew. So the fellows are coming. We're all going to go dancing. Josephine, who sees through all things, Yes. Said, what do you want to tell us, darling? <laughs> and I have no idea where it came from. I blurted out, tomorrow I'm going to become an actor. That is just amazing to go from academia <laughs> <laughs> to running track to the corporate world and then to acting. <laughs> that was plain <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I mean, real, no, it wasn't crazy, they, but it's I, just amazing. When they told my father, he said, it's just another phase he's going through. 